The tragic crash of the Russian jetliner in the Sinai Peninsula yesterday reminds me of a time in Russia when people would not be allowed to pray for their dead publicly, and today people are gathering in prayer as all were lost in that crash, over 200 of their citizens, including many children. You know, the Soviet Union outlawed public manifestation of religion, and the official religion, if you will, was atheism. And there was a bishop who became a secret priest and eventually bishop to minister to the Christians in Russia that tells this story about his call to do so. When he was a little boy, he was orphaned and was taken in by his grandmother. The grandmother happened to work for an old priest who happened to be her uncle. She lived there at the rectory and took care of things in the parish for him, so the little grandson now came to stay there as well. And one day, as the Soviet government took over and atheism was the state religion, the Soviet guards were going from church to church and rectory to rectory to see what they could do to stamp out this foolishness called religion. So they came in and they arrested the priest and then about a week later came back to take all of the religious articles they could find and any things he had written to prove that he was a Christian. I don't imagine that would have been very difficult. And they never saw or heard from him again. But when the guards came back the last time and asked the little boy's grandmother if there were any other religious symbols that they could take away from them, she said, well, yes, there is one more, but you can't take it away. And the Soviet guard looked and glared at her like, what do you mean I can't take it away? Of course I will. And then she produced the symbol and made the sign of the cross. That was the moment that her little grandson knew he would become a priest. Her courage, her heroism in the face of hate for God was what inspired that little boy to become a priest. His grandmother is one of those unknown and sometimes unsung heroes of faith we call the undeclared saints. That, dear friends, is what we're celebrating today. Not only all the declared saints by the tens and hundreds of thousands, including the martyrs of the early church and of our own day and time, but those that are not yet declared. Maybe your grandmother, maybe someone who has inspired you by heroic Christian virtue to be the person that you're called to be. In fact, this feast day dates back in the church to a church in Rome called the Pantheon. Now the Pantheon was built by the Emperor Hadrian who was quite a builder in Rome and an extraordinary building. If you have visited Rome, I venture to say you probably went inside this circular temple with an open dome at the top. Architecturally, it was a work of genius. But once the empire became Christian under Constantine, people stopped going to this pantheon. Pantheon means all gods. Hadrian built it as a temple to all the gods, and he had giant statues of his favorite gods in the circle of that temple. But the Christians began to realize that they were not gods at all. And so it was abandoned for hundreds of years. By the year 600, the people came to the pope at that time, and the Holy Father was told that it had become, as an abandoned building, a place of strange sounds and, well, let's say, something like Halloween. The people were very frightened by the things that they heard. It was covered in cobwebs and animals and, as many abandoned buildings become, but even stranger odors and chilling air in the midst of the summer coming out of this building. So the Holy Father, in conference with his advisors, discussed what should be done. And one suggestion was tear the thing down. Now, 
when you see this incredible building, you can see there would be great opposition and it would be quite a difficult project to tear this great building down. So the other prevailing advice was that it should be cleansed, purified, and reconsecrated as a temple to the one true living God under the patronage of Our Lady Queen of Martyrs because there had been so many martyrs in the early church in Rome until they were freed in the 300s that it would be dedicated to the saints, Mary Queen of the Martyrs. And so it is. And from that point on, we have celebrated this feast day as a day to honor all the saints, all of them, martyrs, confessors, apostles, the unknown, and the declared. And what is it that distinguishes the saints? Why do we honor them? They don't need any honor. Once they've come into the presence of God, their joy is complete, total, fulfilled. It's our mission that we're really celebrating. Their intercession for us to follow in their footsteps. You heard in the book of Revelation that there was a countless number before the throne of God that had made it to heaven. And by our baptism, we have the same vocation. That is to say, we are all saints in the making. Saints, if you will, under construction. Now, are we going to work with God, the architect? Will we allow the project manager, the Holy Spirit, to work in us? Will we work with the greatest carpenter of all, Jesus Christ himself, so that we might indeed be built up into the temple of God that we are called to be? That's the challenge. And the blueprint, the design, is given to us in today's gospel, which is the Beatitudes. Because these Beatitudes reveal the kind of virtues that are called for in the Christian, the one who will imitate Christ and whose saints will encourage, cheer us on, if you will, to our goal in heaven. Because you see, virtue is like a particular moral excellence a merit, a praiseworthy quality, a character, characteristic way of behavior which makes both actions and persons good and which also enables one to fulfill their purpose in life. That is, to love God and love neighbor in this world and be with God forever in the next. So, if we follow this virtuous life modeled for us by the saints, then we will experience a transformation from selfishness, for example, to generosity, from timidity to courage. So let's look at these signs for us, these virtues, these goals, and see how we might follow them. And I'll give you examples of saints, and then you think of someone who's modeling it for you even in your own time. First of all, we hear, blessed are the poor in spirit. Poverty of spirit is simply a way of saying humility. Humility, which is the virtue that overcomes false pride. Now, there are many saints who model that humility, but one that comes to mind today for me is St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, the little flower of Jesus, who chose a little way. She wanted to be like a great St. Teresa of Jesus, Teresa of Avila, but she knew in her own weakness she couldn't make it there. She didn't have the extraordinary visions that Teresa of Avila had. She didn't have the fortitude that Teresa had. So how would she do it? And she wrote a magnificent autobiography called The Little Way. Her Little Way. And that humble way is a way that all of us can come closer to God, doing the little things with great love, to put it simply. There's humility recognizing I have to depend completely on God because God is God and I am not, but I am a child of God, a beloved child of God. It is pleasing to God when I follow God's way, what Therese calls the little way. How about blessed are those who mourn? We don't normally think of mourning as a blessed event, but it certainly can be turned into something blessed. For example, I think of a woman named Elizabeth Ann Seton. Elizabeth Ann grew up in New York City in the 1700s. She was an Episcopalian. She was married to a very prominent gentleman who contracted a devastating disease. He was advised by doctors when nothing was helping him in New York 
to sail to Italy. Perhaps the climate there would help. And so they traveled as a family to Italy. Unfortunately, they didn't know Albuquerque existed in the 1700s and could have come here for the pure, clean, dry air, which probably would have helped him. When he got to Italy, he was quarantined, never even got out of the quarantine. And tragically, after many months of nursing and care with not only Elizabeth, but some very devout Italian Catholics that came to help her, he died. But she was so inspired by these loving Catholics that she herself decided to become a Catholic. And when she returned to New York, was rejected by her family for doing so, and eventually had to leave with her many children. They moved to Maryland, where she went to the Bishop of Baltimore, a well-educated woman that she was, and asked him, how are we going to educate the Catholic children? They're so uneducated. And he said, how are you going to do it? And this woman, mourning the loss of her beloved husband at a young age, founds a great order known as the Sisters of Charity. She, a convert, founds the Sisters of Charity, a teaching order that started the Catholic schools all around the United States. She turned her mourning into joy. Blessed are those who mourn. Mourn, yes, for the loss of loved ones and mourn for the sins of the world. But recognize that that can be turned around by grace. What about blessed are the meek? Meek often, meekness often mistaken for weakness, which it is absolutely not, when the Bible tells us that Moses was the meekest man who ever walked the earth, clearly not a man of weakness. Meekness is strength under control. Strength under control. I think of someone like St. Magdalene of Canossa, whose statue we have here in church, the foundress of the Canossian Daughters of Charity in Italy, at a time when Napoleon had taken his wars to northern Italy where she grew up in Verona, devastated the land, and this young woman went up to the emperor, Napoleon, and begged him to give her a church and an abandoned convent near her home. Why, he asked, to tend to the orphans that are the product of this war. That's pretty bold to tell the guy who brought the war on and he was so moved by her courage that he gave her that church, chapel, convent to begin her work and found this great order starting with the orphans of war. That strength under control. Or St. John Neumann, the first bishop of Philadelphia who came to minister as a redemptorist priest from the Czech Republic where he was from, then called Bohemia, serving in the, near the coal miners up in New York State and Pennsylvania, and much oppression because he was a Catholic and there was a lot of anti-Catholicism at that time. He stood firm, he stood strong, and became the first bishop of Philadelphia. We have his relic before us today on the side of Benedict as well as Faustina. Then how about blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness? seeking to do the right thing at all times. That's righteousness, not self-righteousness, but the righteousness that we're called to. How can we possibly do it? By the grace of Christ, it is possible. There, I think of Benedict. Saint Benedict, who was horrified by the evils going on in Rome, left the city, began a contemplative life, and eventually so many were inspired by him that he drew them together and they began Benedictine monasteries. Those monasteries kept faith alive in the dark ages, kept education alive, they were the ones who copied the Bibles when there were no printing presses. For over a thousand years they kept the faith alive, building monasteries all over Europe and then beyond. Even in our own Pecos is a Benedictine monastery. By Abiquiu, another Benedictine monastery. All these many centuries because he thirsted for righteousness, for goodness, for holiness. Benedict, with his small band of followers, began this great work. How about blessed are the merciful? Pope Francis has declared beginning December the 8th, we'll have a holy year of mercy. This world needs mercy because we're out of control. Well, there's a great saint, Faustina, of Poland, to whom Jesus appeared after World War I, 
who said, if people don't trust in my mercy, there are worse wars to come. No one could imagine anything worse than World War I. Well, we now know the rest of the 20th century was riddled with the horror of war. And on the image that Jesus gave St. Faustina to produce, he had at the bottom of it these words, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. And if we trust in his mercy, then we'll follow what the scriptures tell us. Be merciful as the Lord is merciful with you. How about blessed are the pure of heart? I thought of an early American, a Native American, by the name of Kateri Tekawitha. St. Kateri grew up in the Mohawk community. She had an Algonquin mother who had converted. She had become a Christian in the 1600s, but her mother died of smallpox and she lost her father. She was raised by relatives who made fun of her faith. But she had such a pure heart. She'd go out every morning to the chapel where the Jesuits, the missionaries, many of them who had become martyrs, the missionaries had established a mission. And she'd go out snow or rain, whatever the weather was, waiting to go and speak to her Jesus. Eventually moving from northern New York to flee her persecution, the Jesuits took her to southern Canada in Quebec, where she is buried today. The first Native American saint of the United States and Canada. Kateri, purity of heart and how we need purity today. Blessed are the peacemakers, the bridge builders. I thought of John Paul II. St. John Paul traveled the globe more than any other human being in history, speaking to greater crowds than anyone else to build bridges, to evangelize, to bring good news and hope. And he would gather world leaders of all denominations each year in Assisi to pray for peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. And don't we ever need peace today? And finally, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. I think of the North American martyrs, the martyrs of Korea, the martyrs of Japan, the martyrs of the wars. You just go on and on. Those who stood strong, who witnessed, who witnessed to Christ despite their persecution, like Maximilian Kolbe, who took the place of another in the Nazi war and gave his life, that Franciscan saint. Or Bakita, the Kenosian slave sister who was freed and entered the Kenosian Daughters of Charity and stood for love for Christ. You know, when we see a little four-year-old girl killed in our own community because of rage and an officer being taken down, by a criminal on the loose, we have to say to ourselves, we need the Beatitudes now more than ever. We need heroic virtue now more than ever. Saints are not a matter relegated to the past. We are all called to saintly, heroic virtue. So choose a saint, whether declared or undeclared, let someone inspire your soul this month of November dedicated to the holy saints and the holy souls so that we might indeed make a difference. I conclude with the prayer of St. Therese from her little way, that little flower, who prayed this way. And I placed it in the bulletin so you might make that prayer your own. O oh Lord, Grant that I may always allow myself to be guided by you, always follow your plans, and perfectly accomplish your holy will. Grant that in all things, great and small, today and all the days of my life, I may do whatever you require of me. Help me to respond to the slightest prompting of your grace, so that I may be your trustworthy instrument. May your will be done in time and eternity by me, in me, and through me. Amen.